The other day, a friend of mine asked me to join a renewable versus nuclear debate group on Facebook. And I did because I always want to help my fellow nuclear advocates to shed some light on the renewable versus nuclear debate. This time, however, I got something special to address immediately. Written by Matt Carmichael, this article cuts the cake. It's predominantly aimed at the UK, but I will read it in a wider context. I am not going to comment on the planned or unplanned outages of nuclear power plants in Britain. Suffice to say that most of these plants have capacity factors in the high 80s and 90s. So they will beat any other technology in terms of reliability, even though Matt wishes it to be different. Let's break it down and do note that I will address these points as globally as possible. 1. Low carbon is not low enough. Using the word euphemism conveys a clear misunderstanding. To suppose that only nuclear energy requires mining is an abject falsehood. If we would mine all the uranium and thorium on the planet that is economically recoverable now, we would be mining about 12 to 15 million tons of this stuff. In my newest book, which is soon available, I account for 2 billion tons of materials required for Mark C. Jacobson's 100% renewable plan. That's just the generator side. No wiring, no conversion, nothing else. That's a factor of 133 when contrasted with the uranium and thorium pile we had to extract. Even if we would add the construction materials, for the nuclear reactors and their facilities, it would fade away against the gargantuan mountain of stuff we would need for 4.3 million wind generators and 50 billion solar panels. Also, we can recycle just about anything if we have enough energy and the required chemicals to disassociate all the materials used in solar, for instance. And the solar panel is a sandwich of plastic, copper, silver, aluminium, PV elements and glass, which is nigh inseparable, not to mention the impossible to recycle composite wings of wind generators. Point one is smooth. Besides, we have countless of studies that show that life cycle emissions of nuclear power plants are competitive, if not better, with many of the renewable energy sources. Point two, nuclear power needs lots of cold water. Now, he brings up this uh, practical event in France when the water was too hot to cool the reactors. Sure enough, there will be a time when water availability might be stretched. But, inter but it depends. Contemporary reactors can be cooled using a plethora of means, including water. Building these units along shorelines of the seas, for instance, is an option. Another option is to use different coolants altogether. If you look at Arizona, sewage is being used to cool a reactor. We can even air cool reactors if we want to, but that would make them a little bit more expensive. This is not an argument for or against nuclear energy. We can even cool a reactor by using thermal heat pipes that go into rock. A molten salt reactor can be air-cooled. The original was. Point three. Nuclear doesn't solve intermittency. Intermittency is not an issue when addressing climate change. It only props up difficulties for energy suppliers and grid operators. But it is something we can solve. Additionally, there are nuclear reactors that load follow. Look at France, for instance. Newer designs can ramp up and down even quicker. But, they, but here is the question. Which energy source should be leading when we consider grid stability? The intermittent ones or the ones that have a 90% capacity factor and can carry the load? Point four. Life cycle cost is extortionate. If Hinkley C is your perspective, then it is only extortionate because you don't understand how to factor in externalities and do a life cycle cost analysis. 
All I see is sticker price argumentation. You know what 18 billion pounds looks like over 60 years? Hinkley C is 3200 megawatts of solid 90% capacity factor power. That's 11 pounds per megawatt hour, which is still a bit expensive, but not extortionate. Just for comparison's sake, the London Array cost 1.8 billion pounds. It runs for 25 years maximum at a capacity of 630 megawatts and a royal capacity factor of about 45.3%. This means that it will come in at a price of 28.9 pounds per megawatt hour. That's more than double as expensive as Hinkley C on a per megawatt hour basis over the, lifespan, over the lifespan of the plant. Here's the thing though, I trust that we, as a species that adapts, finds a way to learn from these first-of-a-kind projects and creates pathways to end this nuclear is expensive paradigm. I'm not just talking about other technologies, but also about extant technologies like the EPR for instance. Also, this is not a stagnant world in which nuclear is a monolith that won't be moved. It is a dynamic industry with many players wanting to innovate and progress. Point 5. You have to trust proven liars. Let's say that ad hominem attacks are instant disqualifications in any debate. This has nothing to do with nuclear being a valuable asset in the fight against climate change. Besides, I am a nuclear advocate. I've become so because, because I am, by definition, a technocrat. Climate change is the technical problem which requires technical solutions. Nuclear, by its very low carbon and its very low materials footprint, should be the first to be considered every time. Point six, it makes diplomatic hypocrites of us. Well, this is a special case. Um, I'm going to keep it short. The only thing you can do is push for the creation of reactors that consume bombs. In fact, we've already done this with the Megatons to Megawatts program. The Megatons to Megawatts program was probably one of those landmark moments when adversaries learned to work together and make the world a safer place. Nuclear power is not the problem, it is the solution. Point 7. What if everything goes south? Well, basically this is the deadly waste argument. Nothing but uneducated fluff as far as I am concerned. There is no such thing as nuclear waste. It is only waste if you waste it. Spent nuclear fuel is a golden opportunity waiting for those bright students to be picked apart and turned into useful stuff including energy, isotopes for all kinds of applications and other valuable elements. Point 8. It's too late. Actually, the brunt of all the reactors on the planet have been built within a time frame between 4 and 6 years. Commitment is required and that's something we don't show. It is our own fault that some reactors are being built slowly and out of initial cost parameters. It's not the fault of the technology itself. Besides, the Koreans and Japanese built these units between 4 and 6 years. Chinese are pushing for 4 years. Even Rosatom is pushing 5 at this moment. That's fast enough. And then there's the small modular reactors that are coming. Most of these are not merely theoretical, but based on practical reactors that have run for thousands of hours. Consider for instance the molten salt reactor experiment in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I am confident that we can build an MSR a day within 10 years from now. And if you consider terrestrial energy for instance, you can see that we are getting awfully close right now. Point 9. A lot of other things can boil water. Well, to be honest, this is a total non sequitur and has nothing to do with whether nuclear is a valuable asset in the fight against climate change. Point 10. Climate change demands a new attitude to life. This is a case of Western disease. 
we in the West, we use X too much, etc. If we consider population growth models, energy per capita, the correlation between prosperity and energy availability, we may conclude that energy demand is going to rise regardless of what the West does. Developing countries are catching up. They are doing so at a rate that cannot be satiated by nuclear or renewables at this time. That's the reality. We must learn how to work together in order to change these paradigms. And with that, I leave you. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and share. Thank you all for watching and have a nice day.